going to give your colleagues a few seconds to join us, and then we are going to get started this morning. Great to see all of you back. Again, welcome all of you. Great to see you all. Happy Friday. We're going to give everyone a, a second or two to join us, and we're going to get started. Yes, always, always feel free to put your comments in the chat. Always good to see those. And we're great and happy to see you. And let's go ahead and get started, Heather. Thank you. Again, welcome back. This is our sixth annual Meredith Fellows Performance Assessment Implementation Conference. We are on day two, and we thank all of you who presented and attended and dis entered into this discussions yesterday. It was a really powerful day. And here we are again together on Friday. Next slide, please. Welcome back. We're gonna begin this morning with um, our executive director, Mary Vixie Sandy, she's joining us this morning. Uh, in addition to Adam Abraham, who has uh, recently joined the commission's work. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mary, who's going to kick off the morning for us and explain some new work that is ahead of us. Mary, welcome. Thank you so much, Amy. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be with you. I am uh, so, I'm so proud of this work. And, you know, th there is so much effort involved in getting performance assessments built uh, out into the field, revised annually. I mean, the, the workload in for all of us in, in, uh, in performance assessment has been sustained and long and intense. And Amy, I, would, I just want to thank you and your team for carving out this time every year and making it a priority to bring the community together to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly related to performance assessment. This has been a central kind of organizing theme for the commission since the late 1990s when we did a significant review and overhaul the structure of credentialing and, and the commission at the time and the legislature agreed, believed that we needed to embed within preparation some core practices that 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 enabled candidates to demonstrate their practice and 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 their their readiness to begin teaching, and performance assessment has been a real uh, innovation in California that has spread across the country and states grapple with it in many different ways. Our own state has been grappling with it, um, and and you know we have three models that are up and running. I, I believe all three are represented in this. Um, Meredith Fellows Conference, and um, I, that's fantastic. Uh, we have been, uh, we've created in our statute uh, a construct that allows multiple models to emerge. And that has been such an important part of uh, our collective learning about how do we best engage with these strategies inside of preparation, given all of the pressures and all of the pathways and all of the ways in which we are working hard to get a workforce for the schools, but to make sure that that workforce is well prepared. So I really thank all of you for taking the time to be here uh, and to continue to engage with us as we continue, you know, it's a continuous improvement effort and uh, that's a hallmark of this work. So Amy, thank you and your team for putting this together. Could we please go to the next slide? We had some legislation this year that uh, last year, well, it is still this year, it was this year, it was introduced this year to uh, actually retire the teaching performance assessment. And uh, a number of factors um, were driving that. I think the uh, a lot of it having to do with various experiences that, that candidates and program uh, faculty were having and were articulating. And the, the question, should we retain and maintain this uh, theory of action uh, in our system? Um, was prevalent this year in the legislature, and and as we grappled with that in the early part of the year, uh, we you know the the chair chair Grino Shire and I um, made a case uh, and published an article in EdSource where we you know attempted to make the case that this is really quite critical that um, having some central standard for what it what's necessary uh, to to become a teacher it's not sufficient 
but it is necessary. Um, that's the argument we made, and um, it engaged, it enabled us to engage in a number of conversations with interest holders across the spectrum, particularly in the teaching workforce and the you know the, the labor uh, community, but also in the administrator community and in the teacher preparation community. And ultimately, what came out of that was a bill, Senate Bill 1263, that instead of taking the TPA out of action and retiring it, um, renewed it essentially, but directed the commission to establish a work group that would uh, review the design and the implementation of it with a particular focus on um, the, uh, you know, what is the, what is the experience that candidates are having and what is the, you know, feasibility of, of this? How, how feasible is this within teacher preparation? How do we make it more embedded and less duplicative based on feedback that we, we were hearing from the field? These are real issues that we need to take up. Um, and our commitment has always been to, you know, when we know better, we do better. I know I'm getting, um, people are getting tired of hearing those words out of my mouth, but uh, they aren't my words. They're Maya Angelou's and I'm, I'm driven by them. Um, and our, our continual work really does shed light. So we have a moment here to put, um, to put our heads together and do some retrospective review. Where are we in this work? Um, how is this work playing within the context that it must play? And what do we need to do to sharpen it up and keep our, our eye and the system itself focused on the important goal of having very real authentic experiences for candidates in preparation to learn and demonstrate their readiness to teach? Uh, and, and really, I think that's a, a central theme of this conference as, as well. Um, so... The, we have established and the commission appointed at its last meeting a 24-member work group. Uh, we're calling it the RDITPA work group because, you know, every work group needs a really good acronym. Um, and that stands for the, the work group to review the design and implementation of the teaching performance assessments that we have in, in California. And design certainly has to do with how well is the structure meeting the different contexts in which candidates need to, to implement it. And implementation really has to do with, you know, how are we dealing with this in our accreditation system and within our programs so that we maximize its effectiveness and efficiency. So the 24-member group was appointed uh, two weeks ago. Uh, statute required that six or a third of the members be practicing classroom teachers. Uh, also called for um, teacher educators and performance assessment experts. We have, a, I think, a really dynamic group that we'll meet for the first time next week. And would you move to the next slide, please? Thank you so much. I'd like to introduce to all of you Adam Ebrahim, who joined our team and is going to be working with us to facilitate this work and to really help get um, get us to the finish line on it. And Adam, if you wanted to provide a, a high level overview of the five areas that the group has been asked to look at uh, between now and next year, that would be great. Can I turn it over to Adam for a moment and then turn it back to me? Thanks, Heather. Thank you, Executive Director Sandy. I appreciate the, the intro and the warm welcome. And thank you to Commission staff for putting on this incredible event. I, I was you know really inspired uh, listening to the conversations in the sessions yesterday. And I, and I just uh, was, was filled with confidence that the, this moment in time, um, that there are the right people in this community to, to move this forward. Um, so as, as uh, Executive Director Sandy said, the commission adopted a charge at the August meeting for this work group direct, directing essentially five inquiry areas, which you see listed here on the slide. Um, I'm going to drop the link to the item in case you're interested. There's that. Um, but what I've done is, and, and I hope you'll allow me this, this editorial privilege, uh, Executive Director Sandy, is, is flip these into questions that I'd like to pose for you all as you move through today's sessions and as you move back to your universities, your school sites, your classrooms, um, you know, because the thinking that I heard and in and, and the discussions I saw yesterday is really going to be uh, an important source for this work group. It's going to be your ideas, your innovations, your thinking is going to be critical to the success of this endeavor. So where you see that first, uh, that first direction, that first charge of the work group, 
Um, I'd like to flip it into this question and pose it to you as you go about your, your day. From where you sit and the people you support and your colleagues, what modifications do you think are needed to current teaching performance assessments to ensure they are valid, authentic, and feasible for candidates and programs? Moving to number two and flipping it into a question, what ideas do you have to better embed performance assessments into coursework and clinical practice to avoid duplicative work? And the third one, how do we strengthen accreditation to ensure performance assessments are better embedded in coursework and clinical practice? Number four, what are the barriers to, to local scoring? You know, it, it, is, it is certainly allowed for and provided for in current law. So what are the barriers? What are the things that are preventing it from really taking root? And what are your ideas for innovations that could really bring the benefits of local scoring and the information that is gleaned from that process and folded back into rich instruction? And what are your ideas for, for helping us innovate in that space? And finally, the last one, and I think this is in many ways the most important one, uh, which is what are the questions we should be asking candidates to better understand their experience of our system of assessments for the purposes of disciplined improvement. Who are we talking to? Are we asking the right questions? If not, what questions should we be asking? Um, and th this, this homework assignment is, you know, there, there, is a, there is a Dropbox or an inbox for this homework assignment. And so as you do go back uh, to, to your, your places within the teacher preparation system and support, um, and you have these conversations, I'd like to invite you to take a look at when we're going to be having our meetings. Could you go to the next slide, please? And I just dropped a link into the chat, which is uh, to the commission website, where you're going to see all of those different meetings linked in. Um, you are free, and we encourage you to engage in discussions with your colleagues, with your students, with the teachers that you support, ask these questions, consider these questions, and please send us your responses. Send them as public comment, send them as letters, uh, you know, zoom in and tell us yourself. We'd love to see you. Uh, come in person to the to the commission building and sit in the audience and, and come up to the mic. Um, so what we are doing here is we are we are really asking uh, for your help in moving this work forward and your help and bringing your fresh ideas and experiences and the voices of your candidates um, to the RDI TPA work group. And you know, just, just one more thing, uh, it, you, are, you are truly critical thought leaders with a direct connection to the human beings that we are, that are committing to enter the field of education at a hard time. Um, so please talk to them, talk to your colleagues, talk to your cooperating teachers and bring your ideas to the work group. We look forward to hearing you. And um, thank you very much for your time. And I think it goes back to you, Executive Director Sandy. Thank you so much, Adam. I appreciate that. And I, I'm, I'm glad to hear the these reframed as questions and, and the, it is an inquiry-based effort. Uh, the time frame that we've been given to complete this work is very short. This is gonna be like a lightning round. Uh, so in, in selecting and appointing the work group, uh, we were really, you know, looking to make sure we had people who knew something about this work uh, so they could hit the ground running and that's what they're going to do next week. The statute requires that we have recommendations to the commission initially uh, by March of next year uh, and that the commission take action on whatever it's going to take action with related to those recommendations by June. So we have five meetings. Uh, beginning next week before we will have draft, uh, some form of draft recommendations that we do not expect to be complete, um, that we can present to the commission at their February commission meeting. Uh, and then we'll have some follow on discussions later in February, we'll have a chance with the work group to absorb the feedback, um, finish off the any recommendations that uh, are still kind of pending and in development so that we can bring an update in April to the commission uh, and set the stage for adoption of some kind of recommendations by June of next year. And at that point, the team will be working on um, what a three to five year work plan looks like for implementing uh, short term, medium term and long term recommendations that may emerge from this. Um, it's an exciting time. It's a reset 
time. But the thing I'm most grateful for since I've been working on this and helped to write the legislation uh, that enabled us to do this back in the 1990s, dating myself, um, is that we have a very rich statute that that is focused on innovating in this space and marrying practice to preparation in ways that are significant and structured and systematic, but at the same time formative and authentic to the to the the kinds of spaces where candidates are learning and doing their work. Uh, it's the hardest thing I can imagine us doing for teacher preparation and licensure from a state level. So much easier to put a standardized test in play and say, this is the go, no go point. But what a bad idea that is. What a bad idea that's been for years, right? This is a better idea. This is about how we really work within the preparation space to, to get the people that we need well prepared to do this work. Uh, and I'm excited that the, that the statute we wrote lives and it continues to uh, enable and invite innovation, um, and that we have this opportunity now for reflection and uh, looking to the future. So thank you so much, Amy and team, for giving us the time and space to meet with this group and uh, exhort you to great work and great conversations today. Um, and we look forward to engaging with you as we move it forward. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Adam, for joining us this morning. Really appreciate it. And uh, we all look forward to continuing our work together to make sure that our teacher candidates and administrative service candidates have uh, the most supported experience as possible as they engage in performance assessment in California. So thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to conversations going forward. And as Adam invited you, yes, Please, your voices are so important in this conversation that will be ongoing over the coming year, and we really want to hear from you. So with that, uh, we are going to move ahead with our agenda. And you can see on the slide here, a beautiful picture of a resolution. And we want to pause for a second in this community and offer our congratulations to Gay Roby, who has been a colleague for a long time and has recently decided to retire. So we are going to celebrate Gay together and we welcome all of you who have joined us to do that. So it is my honor to introduce to you Gay Roby and I would like again to invite you to celebrate her with us this morning at the Meredith Fellows Conference. Gay has been a producer of MFIC, which is our internal short name to call this conference in the recent years and again this year. She has truly been the chief organizer, the positive energy provider, and the cheerful reminder-er of all tasks in FEC, keeping us all organized. But she has done so much more than keep us organized and on track for uh, this conference. Gay will be retiring from the commission this fall. And to celebrate Gay and thank her, for her contributions to California educators, several of the staff worked collaboratively to provide her with a California state resolution. So I wanna give a thanks to Jonathan Howard, our manager of the commission's governmental relations office and all the staff in PSD and around that contributed to this collective effort. Gay received her framed resolution on Wednesday and Cheryl and I were with her on Teams when she opened her gift. And she was truly del and delightfully surprised. And we were very happy to be with her in that moment. So let's learn a little bit more about Gay. Gay split her time between the administrative services accreditation work of the professional services division and support, which was supported by Cheryl Hickey and uh, David Gear and Terry Clark. And in the world of performance assessment as well, the performance assessment development and support of the Cal APA because we both had the honor of working with Gay over the last 10 plus years. I first worked with Gay 25 years ago as we were engaging in the beginning teacher support and assessment program. So I've known Gay for quite some time. Cheryl Hickey and I would like to read on behalf of Assemblywoman Lisa Calderon of the 56th Assembly District, the text of Gay Roby's resolution. So I know on the slide, it's a little bit teeny and you can't really see it. So we're gonna go ahead and read this out loud and celebrate Gay uh, this morning. So the resolution begins. Whereas 
Gay Roby is retiring after 35 years in the field of education, thus bringing to a close an esteemed career as a teacher, coordinator, and consultant. And it is appropriate at this time to highlight her many achievements and extend special public recognition and commendations to her for her professional and civic leadership. And whereas having begun her career in the multiple subjects program at California State University Fullerton in 1989, Gay Roby went on to teach core classes at middle schools in the Rowland and Norwalk La Mirada Unified School Districts, where she taught her favorite subject, Colonial American History. And after joining the Norwalk La Mirada Unified School District Administrative Office in 2000, she began coordinating state programs for prospective teachers to earn their credential, which included the newly created Beginning Teacher Support and Assessment Program, we often call BITSA. And whereas, following five years of dedicated service, Gay accepted the cluster for regional consultant position for the BITSA program, which entailed overseeing and providing support to more than 40 higher education and local education agency-based teacher induction programs in the greater Los Angeles area. And in 2010, she joined the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing and took her myriad talents, deep knowledge of education and educator preparation and decades long experience in the classroom to the state level as a consultant. And I will turn it to Cheryl Hicks. <clears throat> Whereas for two years, and much longer than that actually, Gay worked closely to support the shift of how California inducts new teachers into the profession by moving the BITSA program from a statewide grant program that focused on specific assignments for new teachers to a job embedded, individualized induction experience with a central focus on mentoring and individualized support. And in 2012, she began leading an advisory panel to comprehensively review and update the administrative services standards and performance expectations to ensure that all new administrators were prepared to teach students in the 21st century and beyond. And whereas in, collabor in a collaborative setting, Gay worked with her colleagues to produce a different set of preparation standards and performance expectations for new school and district administrators, and to create an administrator induction experience centered on support and coaching. And for more than 10 years, she has continued to work closely with the administrative services community in California to ensure solid preparation for leadership in California public schools. And whereas Gay Roby has contributed extensively to public education in California, and her significant efforts are deeply valued by those who have worked with her and who have been impacted by her many talents. Now, therefore, be it resolved by, the, by Assembly Member Lisa Calderon that Gay Roby be commended for her distinguished record of leadership as a California educator, coordinator, and consultant, and extended sincere best wishes for continued success in the future. Resolution 1375, dated 13th day of September 2024. And I just want to say, Gay, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you since 2002. Um, and I can say you're always the consummate professional. But beyond that, you are probably the kindest person I have ever met and the most gentlest soul. Um, even with your constructive criticism, you're always kind and gentle, which makes you an amazing teacher for all of us. So thank you. We are going to miss you. We know we have you for a little while longer, maybe a month or two, but um, really, really going to miss you. And, um, and I love that all the statements that everybody's making in the, in the comments. So thank you for that. And I'll turn yeah. it back over to Aaron, uh, Amy. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. And again, let's have a round of applause for Gay Roby's work. And please do put your thoughts in the chat. If there are one or two of you, maybe we can flip back, Heather, to the gallery um, and pin Gay so that we can all see her. But if anyone would would like to take a few uh, verbal comments, if anyone would like to add to the statements, I know some of your past colleagues, Gay, have joined us. I know some of your family members are here. So uh, we want to just spend a few more minutes. If anybody would like to unmute and share their thoughts, that would be fantastic. So let's... this is Katie Croy, if you can hear me. Hi, Katie. We can hear you. Welcome. Thank you. Well, I can't tell you how much I love Gay Roby. Not because she was my sweet mate, but because she was probably the kindest person I've ever worked with in my entire life. Mm -hmm. I came in about uh, a month and a half after Gay, 
and she immediately became my mentor and um, my confidant. And I could trust her with everything that I, every question I had, she never made me feel wanting or lacking because I had questions. She was always a part of everything that it, it didn't matter what anyone asked her to do. You knew that it was going to be perfectly done. And you knew that she was going to do it with a sweet spirit. And I just haven't met very many people like that. And so I feel honored to be called her friend. And I have out on my doorway, as you enter my home, where I now live in Arizona, a lovely um, logo that says Croy, our Croy home. And she was integral in getting that for me as, as I left. CTC. So Gay, I can't imagine how they're ever going to replace you. I think maybe, oh, 10 people could do it, but that's about, about right for replacements. So thank you for being such a model for all of us. And I know that the institutions that I visited, whenever we would talk about anything in the administrative arena or anywhere else that you had had a touchstone with, there were always positive comments and thank yous that I could bring back to you because that's how you were. You always gave to others. So I just think you're wonderful. And I, I am excited about the next journey in your life. And I hope I will still be a part of your life in some small way. I love you greatly. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Katie. Let's hear from a few others. Anyone else like to speak? Hello. We are some of Gay's children who are very lucky to be in her family. And I just wanted to share with you all, um, sometimes people are one way at work and another way at home in their family lives. And um, Gay is all of the things that you have said at home and with her family, as well as in her work life. Um, I feel incredibly, incredibly blessed to have been welcomed into her family by marrying her beautiful, fabulous daughter. And um, and yes, we're so proud of you, Gay, and we love and adore you. And thank you to the conference for allowing us to be here to witness this. Thank you. We love you. <laughs> and our, her grandchildren are at school right now. Otherwise, they would be here as well cheering her on. Well, we're glad to hear they're at school. Uh, and great to see you both and meet you. And thank you for joining us this morning. Let's take a few more. Do we have another one, Heather? Yes, me. Yes, James Webb. That is a voice that we... I'm back. <laughs> Hi, James. <laughs> I just wanted to say to uh, echoing everyone else, Gay, you have been really instrumental in my career. You have seen me from a teacher to a mentor to an induction director, a state consultant and an administrator. And I just want you to know what an important part of my journey has been due to you. Uh, I was so blessed that you and I finally did a site visit together. It took what, 20 years, but we finally did one. And it was such a joy to be working with you. I wish you well. Uh, you know I'm going to want to hear about all your trips to Disney World, Disneyland, uh, Disney Cruises, because that's something that you and I both share. But you really have been there, not just for me professionally, but also personally saw me through uh, my family creation and everything. So thank you so much for everything you've done. Okay. And I hope you have a wonderful retirement and you will always be a special person to me and my family. So gay, this is Terry, and I am so excited that you are retiring. Congratulations, almost 30 years we've worked together. You work so hard. You are so smart. You are so thoughtful. Enjoy your life, enjoy your children, enjoy your grandchildren. And I hope I get to see you as part of your retirement too. So anytime you're up here, I have a spare room. <laughs> uh, thank you, Terry. Thank you for taking time to join us this morning. It's so good to see you as well. Is there, how about, I think we have time for maybe one or two more and then uh, we will get back to the good work of performance assessments. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Gay's youngest. And just want to say that in addition to being uh, her wonderful son, I had the privilege of having her as my teacher in eighth grade for that colonial history. And it really 
<laughs> it inspired me to study, <clears throat> excuse me, study history in college as well. So her, her impact is very well felt in everything she's done for me. Wonderful. Thank you. How, how special to get to have your mom as your teacher. That's awesome. Let's take one more, Heather. And then again, we invite you to put your comments in the chat or please do on your own, reach out to Gay. She will absolutely be missed at the commission. Is there one more colleague who'd like to share their thoughts before we move on this morning? I, I would, but Mary Sandy here. Please, I, Mary, please. Just be the cleanup hitter and say, Gay, uh, you're irreplaceable. And uh, I don't, uh, you know, I don't, I'm, not, I'm still processing that. Um, but uh, I, I just can't can't say how important a member of our team you've been. Um, just the connective tissue in so many different ways, uh, and helping to keep the work moving forward, keeping our eye on the on the ball, um, and on the teachers, uh, and on all the people who need to support and um, and enable the you know the workforce to emerge that we need and and to be strong and focused in in their in their work. Truly, I have um, enjoyed working with you more than I can say. And um, thank you. Thank you on behalf of the commission, on behalf of all of the staff at the commission uh, and our larger community. Thank you. Well, thank you. Gay, I know we chatted about this. I don't know if you would like a word. If not, no problem. We will congratulate you and move on. Did you? But I wanted to give you Just a chance. a great... Great, great, great big thank you for all the kind words and the Disney references, even the baseball references that Mary got in there. They know I'm a baseball fan, so go Dodgers. So. so thank you all so much. It has been a wonderful career, and I will miss each and every one of you. Ah, Well, Gay, don't worry. We know how to find you. <laughs> we will be in touch. We will do all we can to keep you with us, certainly uh, as we go forward with this important work. And again, we thank you so much for all you have contributed, for your thoughtfulness, for your kindness. And uh, we will continue to uh, enjoy every day we have with you before you move on into your well-deserved retirement. And we know you're going to enjoy uh, having a little more time perhaps to yourself and for your family and all your wonderful grandchildren. But we do thank you very, very much for all you have contributed and we will miss you deeply. So with that, again, please, I encourage you to reach out to Gay, share your congratulations, and thank you again to all of you who joined us uh, to have this special moment with Gay. And we were um, very excited that we could provide this uh, commemorative resolution so she can hang that up in her home and remember all of the amazing things that she has contributed to education. So thank you, Gay, and thank you to all of you. All right, yes, big round of applause. So we're gonna just kind of take 10 seconds here uh, as we get ready to move into our next presentation of our general session this morning. And again, we thank Executive Director Mary Vixie Sandy and Adam for joining us this morning on the SB 1263 work that's ahead of us. We thank Gay for all she has done. And we wanted to take a moment to share with you uh, some of our recent uh, research and findings and conversations with our beginning teachers and our program coordinators with our assessors and with our teacher coordinators that help support the teachers that came through our recent work on a literacy performance assessment. Heather uh, Kennedy and I were able to present this to the commission in August, but we think the information is informative and we always like to share our research. We always take two years to develop or longer our performance assessments uh, for the commission's models in California. We take the work very seriously. We always work with a group of educators that we call design teams that are made up of both teachers and faculty, instructors, coaches, mentors that are engaged in the work for the credential area that we're working on for the performance assessment. And uh, that is true in this case as well. We had a group of about 24 who joined us as well as the Department of Education in launching this next version of performance assessment work for teachers in California. And we wanna share those findings. So we'll go back to the slide and we'll get started. 
Uh, so this is an update on the pilot study findings and the development of the literacy performance assessment work, or as we call it, the LPA for short. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it uh, on the next slide to Heather Kennedy. She and I will co-present this work and we're uh, always interested in your comments. If you wanna put them in the chat as we go, you are welcome to do that. But Heather, why don't you get us started? Thank you. Yes, thank you. So uh, as Amy mentioned, we have worked with a design team to develop the ver pilot version of the literacy performance assessment. And we began by using Cal TPA cycle two assessment driven instruction as the foundational document to begin the work. And we built from the four steps of plan teach and assess, reflect and apply. In step one of the LPA, candidates review recent literacy assessments, screenings, literacy and or language profiles or other information for their students with their cooperating teacher. They select one focus student. They provide contextual information for their group of students, including their focus student. And they briefly describe three to five literacy lessons, including corresponding formative and summative assessments. In step two, teach and assess, the candidates conduct and video record the lessons and assessments that they planned in step one. They then select video clips and provide commentary for each video clip. In step three, the candidates engage their group of students in the summative assessment and evaluate the responses using performance criteria that they've set forth. They analyze and reflect on student results from the summative assessment based on the performance criteria and they submit the focus student summative assessment response. And in step four, apply, the candidates plan a reteaching or an extension activity for one or more students based on what they've learned. They video record that follow-up activity and they select one video clip and provide written commentary for that video clip. We're gonna move into the next section now. Thank you, Heather, for that overview. And we're gonna talk about our uh, candidate participation um, by credential area, pathway, sector, and ethnicity. So in front of you, you're going to see a, a table and we're gonna move through several tables here and give you a quick glimpse into who was involved in this pilot study this past spring of 2024. So you can see here on the spring, we had a range of teacher educators join us in this work. We had a total of 219, and the work is focused on the multiple subjects work, our work of our ed specialists across our five credentials, and on our very newest PK to three credential in California, we're so proud and excited to have to support our youngest learners. Uh, at the time of this pilot, we did not yet have approved PK to three programs. So we split our uh, candidates into those candidates who are working in TK to three settings, and also then our candidates working in four to eighth grade settings and studied them as separate groups to help inform what we needed to do to get ready for the second year of development and for our field test that's coming up in 2025. So these are our candidates that participated. Next slide, please. Number of candidates by pathway. As you know, in California, we are so uh, very good at allowing all kinds of ways to prepare our teachers to come into the pathway uh, and follow different pathways into the profession. We know our uh, interested educators need lots of different kinds of support. And of course, all support is contextually related. But we were able to look at different pathways. So we had 82 who joined us who were in traditional fifth year programs. So they have undergraduate degrees and are coming into a fifth year of study. We had district interns, university interns. We had 19 who joined us from our newly growing and exciting programs called residencies in California, where teachers get a full year of experience of being in a classroom with a coach and that classroom teacher. And then we also had our integrated undergraduate um, candidates join us. And again, new innovation in California where we have uh, undergraduate programs that bring them up through not only their undergraduate content work, but into teaching. And then finally, university private school programs, also traditional fifth year. So quite a range of pathways are represented. Next slide, please. please. In this slide, you can see how that spread across our different credential types. So on the far left, you see multiple subject candidates and you can see that the majority of them were in student teaching programs. 
come over to our, um, what we call PK3 in this, but they are those um, PK to three multiple subject teachers. And we had 30 in our university uh, fifth year teaching programs, et cetera. As we come across towards the left, you can see that in our ed specialist programs, we begin to see that dark blue um, bar and the light blue bar build. And we know that so many of our ed specialists come into our profession through intern programs, both district intern programs and university intern programs. So just a quick picture there to show you the distribution. Let's go to the next slide. We also are curious how uh, things are going by sector. And so we were able to have uh, 116 candidates who are enrolled in CSU programs, 71 in private independent, 32 attending LEA county office programs. At this point uh, for that pilot, no, no candidates in the UC programs joined us, but it did again, as I pointed out, lead us to 219 candidates who participated. We also wanted to make sure that we were representing all of our different uh, groups of candidates. So here you can see the numbers of uh, candidates. This is self-report data. So I'll give you a second to look at that. Let's go to the next slide, please. And this takes us into looking a little bit at what, who assessed, who came along and joined our assessor training and engaged in looking at these responses. And we used a consensus scoring model where there were two educators who were calibrated, who took a look at and determined final score judgments. So we had quite a number of assessors, 79 who joined us. There are explicit qualifications for assessors by credential. And you can see that we were able to score 218 of the submissions. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna turn our attention a little bit to some more of the quantitative data. And this picture just gives you a sense of who again was in that pilot. So we had 213 candidates who passed. That was a 97% pass rate. We had 218 that we scored and we had 219 that were submitted. So one that was submitted was unscorable because it was not 100% complete, and we do not score assessments if we don't have all the evidence we need. So again, just another way to display that data about who participated in the pilot study this past spring. This picture lets you take a quick look at pass rate by pathway. Interns uh, pass at a 90% pass rate, followed by the rest but you can see across our pathways, a very good performance by our candidates with the literacy performance assessment. Next slide, please. We wanted to provide some pass rate uh, data and findings by ethnicity. So you see in the end submitted is the number of candidates who submitted, and then we have the number of candidates who passed and the number of candidates who did not pass. And I'll give you a second to take a look at that data. So we had 219, as we've discussed, who submitted. We were able to uh, score and then see passing scores achieved by 213 of those candidates. Five candidates did not pass. Let's go to the next slide. This is always a very interesting slide, I think, and it's really been very helpful uh, every time we stop and really look at and study our data, which is very often across every year that we've implemented performance assessments. But this again is for uh, the LPA. And what you see here are bars that start on the left and come across to the right. You can see that farthest bar is representative of the score of 15. And we had uh, 24 of our candidates reach that. And then our passing standard is 14 points. So the commission adopted this passing standard last August, uh, and we shared that with candidates and programs as they came into the pilot study that candidates needed to reach those 14 points. They could do it in any way across the eight rubrics. Each rubric has five points possible. So candidates did need to demonstrate that they had evidence across those analytic rubrics to get to that score of 14, and you can see that green arrow. Everyone at 14 and above 
passed the assessment. And you can see the scores going all the way up to 37. Um, and our mean score is circled in yellow at 21 points. So the mean uh, of candidates ended up at 21, uh, much higher than our passing score of 14. So again, this is just a nice way to get a good look at the distribution. Here we have that for you again. And this time we're looking at our pass rates and our overall mean scores. Again, remember the score to reach was 14. So you can see these mean scores all much higher uh, than 14. Um, as we go forward, this is very helpful information to us as we all go back and think about supports to candidates, as we think about our programs and what we need to be offering around what is laid out for us in SB 488, the literacy standard that we are all uh, working towards implementing and assessing as we go forward. So we'll go ahead and move to one more slide. And here you see the distribution across rubric scores. Whenever we're developing a performance assessment, we very carefully study how our rubrics, individual rubrics are performing. And what this chart shows you is uh, the levels uh, uh, and numbers that were achieved at each level. So uh, it's very interesting data for us and it really helps us then dig in with our design team as we did this summer to look at this data and think about what we need to revise going into the field test, which will begin in January of 25 and run through uh, April, May of 25 as we score that out. We'll iterate again and then move on. But you can see in rubric one, we had quite a number of scores of one and two. And then we go on across the rubrics. We had many more scores of four and five. And part of that was due to a, a change in how we write our rubrics with providing less expectations around constructs at four and five. We just, um, in this model, have one more thing you need to demonstrate at four and then one more thing at five. And those of you who were in the pilot have seen those rubrics and um, we appreciate all the feedback that we received around this. So with that, I'm gonna turn it to Heather, who's gonna take us through the next part and get us a little bit more uh, into some of the findings that are really helping us shape the next version for our upcoming field test. Heather? Thank you. Survey data was collected from candidates, program coordinators, cooperating teachers, working with teacher candidates and assessors based on their pilot participation in the areas of their opportunity to demonstrate knowledge, skills, and abilities, clarity and ease of use of our assessment materials, and LPA pilot information and support provided to participants in the pilot. Respondents were asked to rate their level of agreement with statements using the scale strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, and don't know or does not apply. So starting with opportunity to demonstrate knowledge, skills, and abilities, we asked program coordinators and cooperating teachers about the LPA allowing candidates to demonstrate their literacy, knowledge, skills, and abilities in an authentic way. And 100% of the program coordinators strongly agreed with this statement and, or agreed with this statement. And 93% of the cooperating teachers strongly agreed or agreed with this statement. When looking at clarity and ease of use, Candidates and program coordinators agreed or strongly agreed that the directions were clear for how to identify their focus student. Candidates reported that focusing on one student made it easier to understand that student's literacy learning needs. 95% strongly agreed or agreed. And candidates were provided with choices for their focus student that aligned with the grade level, age ranges, and authorization statements for each of the credential areas. Program coordinators also strongly agreed or agreed with this statement. Similarly, 97% of cooperating teachers strongly agreed or agreed that focusing on one focus student made it easier for candidates to understand that student's literacy needs. 21 candidates and four program coordinators expressed that the clarity and ease of use for how to plan for English language development um, was, sorry, excuse me. So we had 21 candidates disagree that the directions for how to plan for English language development were clear. And this is something that we're taking a look at to focus on clarifying 
and preparation for our field test. Conversely, only four program coordinators disagreed with this, so this is something that we're continuing to take a look at. Candidates and program coordinators were asked about the directions for how to provide, focus, provide students with feedback from the summative assessment. This was an area that candidates found unclear. However, program coordinators found this area clear. So this is something that we are taking a look at. Open-ended responses indicated that candidates were unsure of where to put the feedback when they were submitting their assessment materials. And so this is another area that we are continuing to take a look at in the field test revisions. When program coordinators and assessors were asked about the way the LPA guide was organized, if it was easy to find information that they needed, like the rubrics being embedded within the steps, using the glossary, links to resources, we had strong agreement from our program coordinators and assessors on this item. 100% of assessors strongly agreed or agreed that the assessment guide directions provided in the LPA were clear. We also had strong agreement regarding the LPA essential questions being clear. And Amy is going to speak to the LPA pilot information and support. Thank you, Heather. And again, our essential questions, remember everyone drive what our rubrics are measuring, which are aligned to the teaching performance expectations that are required of candidates and programs and we have our new literacy domain and elements under there that look at extensively how SB 488 lays out for us, how literacy should be uh, taught in California along with our ELA ELD framework. So let's continue on. Let's share some more findings. Here what we're seeing is uh, again, um, strong blue bars. And what we were looking at was how program faculty and instructors provided uh, support. So we're looking at supports and our candidates are telling us they felt well supported during the pilot. Our cooperating teachers felt that they also uh, thought the candidates were well supported by the faculty. In this slide, we're looking uh, at results from our cooperating teach around our cooperating teachers. These are the teachers of the classroom. So we have our teacher candidate, we have our cooperating teacher, and then of course we have our faculty instructors uh, and coaches that provide that support from the teacher preparation program. So in this case, what we're looking at is whether or not the cooperating teacher was able to engage with the teacher candidate. And again, strong blue bars. Candidates uh, did have uh, a handful of candidates, 11 of them, who th did not feel that their cooperating teacher provided sufficient support, but the vast majority of the candidates did feel support from their coordinating teachers uh, and uh, the, can the coordinators themselves. Uh, from our institutions of higher ed and our LEA programs felt that the cooperating teachers were engaged. Uh, all of them that responded to the survey uh, felt that that relationship between the cooperating teacher and the uh, teacher candidate was strong, apparently. So that's, that's good news. So let's go to the next slide. Here we're looking at the cooperating teachers. Uh, we had 30 who were engaged and responded to the survey. And they said that they did review the materials with their um, teacher candidates in their classrooms, which was great. Let's go to the next slide. Again, uh, we asked them, were you able to support your candidate and specifically around the ELA literacy standards as the teacher candidate prepared their lessons, right? So that again, that dialogue and discussion between the classroom teacher and that beginning teacher, the teacher candidate around what literacy should be offered to the students of that classroom, that relationship was reported to be quite strong. And so again, good news there. As we continue on then to the next slide, we're gonna look at qualitative findings now, uh, which are always very interesting. These are open-ended questions. We did a whole series of focus groups to talk directly to teacher candidates about their experiences. And I'll turn it over to Heather for this next part. Yes, so candidates engaged uh, uh, along with program coordinators, cooperating teachers and assessors in focus groups. And these were some of the responses from those open-ended questions. 
So candidates were asked if they felt that the performance assessment provides a better opportunity to demonstrate their ability to teach reading, writing, listening, and speaking rather than a multiple choice exam such as RECA. And an analysis of the survey and focus group responses indicate that candidates appreciated the LPA as an alternative to RECA. They saw it as a more authentic assessment of their literacy knowledge and that it acknowledged their diverse student populations. While they found participating in a pilot challenging, they felt that being able to showcase their skills in a performance assessment rather than an exam kept them from being negatively impacted by test anxiety, and they found it to be a meaningful, enriching experience in how to teach literacy. There were some additional responses related to this prompt, and candidates also appreciated the clear rubrics that communicated the expectations of the assessment. Program coordinators were also asked the same question, and they expressed that the rubric-based feedback that candidates and programs receive allow both the candidate and the program to improve. They also shared that having candidates review recent literacy assessments and demonstrate understanding is a more real-world application of literacy instruction. Cooperating teachers were appreciative of the practical experience of the LPA as it aligned to what teachers do daily in the classroom. They shared that this was helpful, practical, and beneficial to the candidates when they participated in the pilot. Candidates expressed that they use the rubrics to ensure that all constructs within the rubrics were used and they used them to self-assess their work. They also indicated that while they found the use of the rubrics helpful and the self-assessment helpful, that this could sometimes lead to their second guessing what they put into their submission. Program coordinators use the rubrics to assist candidates with coaching and sentence framing to create self-assessment tools and to have candidates map their evidence to the constructs within the rubrics. We have some key findings from the scoring surveys and focus groups. Overall, the candidates and programs found that the LPA allowed them to demonstrate their literacy instructional practice in an authentic manner, and they appreciated the flexibility of the choices that were built into the LPA. The following points on the slides outline the key findings from the pilot study data they found focusing on one student effective for their focus student. The instructions for using the ELA literacy standards and the ELD framework were clear, but simplified explanations would be appreciated. Providing examples and clearer definitions for direct, systematic, and explicit would help candidates better understand these approaches. Those terms come directly out of SB 488, and so they are used really consistently throughout the program standards, TPEs, and in the LPA. Candidates were able to identify students' assets, cultures, languages, dialects, and or home communities. However, they were challenged to address these within their lesson planning and to bring that information into their planning. And that was what Amy referenced in the 2.1 rubric scores when she was going over that scoring data. Candidates should also continue to provide ELD standards and goals regardless of the number of English learners within their class. Candidates and program coordinators appreciated the flexibility in their choices. The candidates appreciated having multiple means of representing their learning. Candidates should be required to provide feedback to students that is explicit and related to the ELA literacy and ELD learning goals that they establish. Candidates would benefit from examples of product, process, and performance assessments. Using one construct in levels four and five of the rubrics allowed candidates to demonstrate the full range of performance within the rubrics of the LPA, and providing mid-range examples for programs and candidates to reference would be beneficial. And Amy is going to talk about the literacy design team findings and our next steps. Yes, thank you, Heather. 
So we are sharing lots of data with you. Um, so I want to back up and kind of remind everyone what we were able to do. So as we concluded the pilot study and scored out all of those submissions, we then used surveys to capture additional feedback. Uh, all four of our types of educators that were involved, from our teacher candidates to our cooperating teachers, to our program coordinators and faculty, to our assessors, were uh, in invited to respond to surveys. They were also invited to join focus groups. So uh, then, and that is all the data that we have shared so far. We took all of that data, Heather and I, and organized it with the help of our contractor evaluation systems group of Pearson. And we brought it forward to our design team that I spoke about. So we had been meeting with the design team for a full year to get uh, the materials, the assessment guide ready for the pilot. And then we brought all of the data back to them in July and went through all of it with them and studied it carefully. And then they added their feedback. So this is again, additional um, insights, feedback, direction to commission staff for revisions as we are preparing now for the spring 2025 field test. So uh, here are in front of you, all of the educators that joined us in that work. And we thank them so much for giving us uh, time over a full two year time span to be involved and to participate uh, with their expertise and experiences as we bring this literacy performance assessment along. We also really wanna call out and thank Nancy Brennelson from this, who is our statewide literacy co-director and Bonnie Garcia, both uh, work together through the Department of Education in their effort and outreach to everyone around literacy on how literacy will be addressed, taught, offered to our youngest learners and our students in California going forward. And this collaborative work with the Department of Ed is so important so that we're making sure as we prepare teachers, they're really ready then to move into school districts who are also uh, offering literacy instruction in a way that lines up with what we're doing in our teacher preparation programs and what we're measuring in our literacy assessments. So thank you to all of these educators, really appreciate you. And um, you're not done yet, you'll keep working with us through this next year as we come through uh, the field test. All right, so what did the literacy design team dis determine? Uh, we kind of split these findings up by step. So as you remember back to that graphic, our performance assessments in the commission's model have four clear steps, planning, asset-based instruction to meet the needs of all students and children that they're working with. That is step one, planning. And so around that, uh, the design team came back with these findings that really we needed to be very careful to define the words direct, systematic, and explicit. And that our candidates are not always using these words or demonstrating their practice in this manner. And so we know there are supports that need to be in place here. And um, we need to make sure that all of our candidates are aware of what these words mean in light of literacy instruction, direct, systematic, and explicit. It is uh, very difficult to determine uh, what we would think of as systematic instruction in only three to five lessons. So candidates have that choice of designing three, four, or five literacy lessons. Most choose three. So thinking that we can really see that systematic approach is a little difficult inside of that uh, range of lessons. And so we need to go back and really think about asking the candidate to be able to show us how their three lessons are fitting into the larger scope and sequence of the unit of instruction around literacy. So we are looking carefully at that as we come into the field test. We do need to continue to support our candidates in their planning around understanding students' assets, cultures, languages, dialects, and or home communities. And that um, we need to really think about how we help candidates understand those assets and then how those assets of language, culture, dialect, home community be brought into literacy instruction, even into foundational skill instruction. And then of course, as we move up into the theme work, uh, but this is something again, we need to really be there to work with our students around what this means and how we would, those assets really need to be brought into the instruction. 
standards and goals in the writing of this learning segment where they're telling us about their three to five lessons uh, need to be explicit. We need to understand the standards and or strands from the foundations work if they're working with our very youngest learners or from the common core standards if they're in grades kindergarten through up uh, through high school. And we need to make sure that that is explicit as well as those English language development standards and how to really write learning goals. Uh, and we need to hold on to those expectations for our new teachers and we need to be there to support them in learning how to do this. And then we do need to have page limits. We did not put page limits on the evidence we asked the candidates to prepare and we got some very long responses, which, you know, very thorough responses, but uh, we are setting page limits as we come into the field test to see if we can uh, sort of help candidates understand that we can see a comprehensive response. It doesn't need to be 50 or 60 pages long. And then education specialists need to continue to think about how they're working with those instructional support personnel in those settings and how we're helping our beginning teachers understand how to engage with those instructional support personnel. So we're looking at that in the planning and we wanna keep that in place. And then finally, candidates should can continue to provide ELD standards and goals, regardless of the number of English learners in the class, that all students, all children in every class in California are English learners. It just depends on what and where they are in their level of having that literacy uh, grasp of English and how they're using it in reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So all of this came into uh, us as feedback around that first chunk of the performance assessment around planning. And that takes us to the next step, teaching and assessing. So this is where our candidates teach those three to five lessons and video record their work and then go in and provide commentary. So we had in the past asked candidates to go into their videos and annotate them with labels and provide shorter descriptions of what they were doing and why they were doing it. In this model, we're asking for a longer written and or verbal commentary from candidates as they look at their videos of themselves teaching and think about what they're doing, why they're doing it. So that's a real change in this model that's coming forward. Uh, and that all needs to stay in place. And then there was um, a concern. Uh, sometimes we see very appropriate planning in step one, but when we come and watch the videos, we might see instruction um, that is actually misinformed. And we wanna be careful that our teacher candidates are providing accurate instruction. And so there was discussion about how we might do that and that we might uh, build into the rubric uh, the notion that if, in fact, we saw consistent and deep misunderstanding of ELA, ELD framework information, that that needed to be signaled to that candidate through the rubric score. So let's go on. That was our teach and assess again, our videos. Um, and again, videos uh, could be, uh, it, there's a choice around how candidates can um, create their video clips and submit them. They can submit one, two, three, or four videos and um, then again, get into that commentary about what they're doing and why. And then around reflection, the design team felt that candidates should be required to provide uh, actionable feedback to students that is explicit and that maybe we need to provide some models. So just saying great job, good job uh, is not direct enough. We need to be very ex explicit when we're giving feedback to our learners. The candidates could benefit from examples of different ways to assess. So we have formative assessments, we have summative assessments, but we have assessments that could be product oriented. It could be around a process that a student is engaging in. It could be around a performance. And so how do we help our student candidates learn about that full uh, range of types of assessments and how are we seeing them as they engage with their students in their um, work around performance assessment? And then revising the instructions for the submission of the feedback. Again, Heather talked to this a little bit. We need to be very clear about how we would like those candidates to provide that feedback. Sometimes it's verbal feedback, particularly for our younger learners. Uh, and so how do we capture that and how do we help the candidates submit that evidence? And then finally, we get to step four, apply. So how does the teacher candidate take uh, what they learned through the planning step, what they learned as they watched their videos and prepared their commentary about what they were doing and why, how do they look at uh, that reflection work about the effectiveness of their instruction and 
the effectiveness of what the students and children are learning. And then finally, the step four, how do they apply that? So the design team said to us that we need to address uh, the recent literacy assessments candidates plan to use in their learning segments to make a connection in the final step. So what we'd like to see across these three to five lessons is the beginning point is assessment data driven. So what are those assessments happening at the district level? What are those scanners being used? What is that early literacy assessment? Based on that, then what are your three to five lessons? And as you come through your three to five lessons, how at the end, when you're thinking about application, do you go all the way back to your beginning assessments and what those told you, and then what you um, monitor across your lessons to understand where then you need to go next with these learners. So again, lots of good feedback from the literacy design team as they looked at the data that we shared with you this morning. So let's keep going. A few more slides before we wrap it up and then we can see if there are questions in the chat and I'm gonna turn it over to Heather, who's gonna take us into these next steps for preparation for the upcoming field test in 2025. Yes, so based on the LPA pilot results, the surveys, the focus group findings, the recommendations we received from the literacy design team, we are going to work with the evaluation system staff to finalize the LPA tasks, rubrics, and program guides, and we are going to finalize our field test program recruitment. That's pretty final at this point in time. We're working on getting all of the candidate names to prepare for the waiver requests. We're finalizing all of those task rubrics and support materials to get out to the programs towards the end of 2024 and working on requesting those field test candidate waivers for the October commission meeting. And then we'll determine the LPA field test supports for programs and candidates. And then we'll begin the field test in spring semester of 2025 and get that all kicked off and ready to go with our participating programs and candidates. And we appreciate your time this morning. We do still have some additional things to go over for the conference. And we, I think, have about 10 minutes for questions, five, 10 minutes for questions. And if there are additional policy questions after today's session that we aren't able to get to, you can email literacy at ctc.ca.gov. We'll go ahead and take us back into gallery mode for a few moments. And I'll just add as we do that, that we are, Heather and I are also offering another session later this morning. If you do have specific literacy assessment questions, we invite you to come and join us there and we can have a more uh, personal discussion with you about any questions you might have. I do see some questions that came up as we were presenting. I believe we addressed that the secondary standing passing standard was not applicable to this pilot. That's only applicable to the operational performance assessments. We did ha have a question. Do you recommend we use your pass rate data for a benchmark for our data? And Brenda, could you clarify your question for us? Thanks, I had to find the get off mute button. That's okay. okay. Yeah, because I, I really like the information you shared. I, I love the way you drilled down the you drilled down really um what you learned for us. And I was thinking about, you know, those benchmarks. What are we looking at in terms of a percentage passing? You know, what are we comfortable with or what's acceptable? And so I was wondering the pass rate that you shared, is that a good benchmark? for us to say, oh, we're doing quite well based on our instruction and how our teacher candidates are performing on this test because it's pretty much at par with what was obtained during the pilot. Or is that sample too small to use that as a benchmark? What do you think? Well, that is a really great question. And I like uh, particularly your last part of your comment there about um, keeping in mind the size of the pilot. So we had the 218 scored responses and we can think of those as 218 individuals who scored at that level. We also need to keep in, so we can maybe generalize a little bit. We do have a fairly representative sample, but um, it is a smaller 
group when we think about the fact that we have anywhere between six and 8,000 candidates a year engaging in performance assessment around teacher preparation. So um, yes, it's informative information and, and absolutely can help us think about uh, assessment design. And it can also help us think about what we need to look at for, for student candidate performance. But uh, really in this work, the commission last August set a passing score of 14 points over eight rubrics. So the total could have been 40 points. They said reaching 14, where we're seeing that beginning teacher practice, it's brand new literacy instruction, perhaps it's new for everyone. Let's, let's help put out a supportive passing standard. So what's going to happen after the field test is we will begin, all, we will run the same set of analyses, we'll do all of the survey work, we'll do all of the focus group work, we'll do all the scoring, we'll look at all of that again, and we will work with what's called the standard setting panel, that's a, yet again another group of educators who have that deep literacy expertise, and think about what would be a supportive passing standard to set for the first year, second year of implementation, and then as we see more and more candidates engaging, we can continue to study that data and do a, a probably second uh, standard setting study to see really where candidate performance is falling. And when we look at that complete set of data and look at where candidates are performing, then we can make recommendations to the commission about what to set as a passing standard going forward. What I can share with you right now is in our assessment cycle, where we have eight rubrics, the passing standard is 19 points, 19 points. So if that were, if that were to happen again, not to say, I'm not saying that it will, it could be much lower than that as we begin this work together, um, we would want to go back to that frequency chart and look at everybody who's 19 and above, still many were above 19. Uh, so it's a complicated answer to your question. I think it is informative. I think we want very much to support every candidate as they come through this work. We want candidates to submit their very best practice. And we want to make sure that candidates have that opportunity to self-assess their work, to have peer engagement, to have faculty review, coaching review, the cooperating teachers review of their work. So that when they, they're coming in, they're really submitting for the first time their best work so that they can pass it on the first try. And if that's the case, then yes, we will still see very high pass rates uh, in California around these performance assessments. That would be a goal. We want every teacher to be able to demonstrate what we're asking in the um, analytic rubrics. And remember, the rubrics are representing the teaching performance expectations that programs are asked to teach to introduce, to practice, and to assess. So that's my answer, Heather. Do you wanna add anything? I, I think you really solidly covered it. I, the only other thing that I was going to say in addition to the passing standard being different is that the sample is also including all different credential programs. So mild, moderate, multiple subject, and those also have different passing standards currently for the operational version. So sometimes it could be really comparing apples and oranges, I think, compared to the operational version. So it is sort of um, not necessarily a direct comparison um, regarding pass rates, passing standards, all of those things. So definitely looking at the field test, which is going to be a slightly larger sample, um, and, and those results coming up is going to be uh, much more informative for us and in seeing how that uh, aligns with our pilot results. Yeah. Well, you were both explicit in your response. Thank you very much. And that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Kinda. Thank you. I did see, Mayumi, you had a question about unique themes emerging based on a program. That's a great question. One thing that I can think of that we didn't talk about in our presentation was focus student choice was definitely a unique theme that emerged based on programs where in our multiple subject programs, English learners were the focus student choice primarily for our multiple subject candidates. And as we moved into our ed specialist, mild, moderate support needs and extensive support needs, they selected students who had more of a challenge with meeting the standards for literacy. Uh, and that's outlined fully in the commission item around literacy. So there's a breakdown 
uh, with the full pilot results of who was selected for the focus students by credential area. So that was definitely a unique theme based around credential area that we saw was a shift based on their the credential they were earning. Amy, did you want to add any other unique theme that we saw based on the data? No, other than, um, you know, as Heather pointed out, uh, we had a, the task of really trying to study carefully what was happening with our multiple subjects candidates, what was happening with our mild to moderate candidates, what was happening with our extensive support needs candidates, our deaf and hearing, hard of hearing candidates, our visual impairment candidates, and our early childhood special education candidates. And uh, we did definitely look at things by sector. We looked at things by pathway. We did see that unique uh, situation where interns, would be they in our district intern programs or our institutional higher ed programs, uh, perform slightly lower than others. So we wanna be paying close attention to that as we come into the field test, making sure that our intern candidates get all those supports that we need to be there to provide to them so they can be as successful as possible in really demonstrating their capacity to teach literacy. Uh, so that was that was one thing. Um, but yeah, still so much to learn about this. Our pilot was very helpful to us. We again thank everyone on our design team and all of those candidates all of those program coordinators, all of the cooperating teachers and the assessors who came along to engage. We invite you to consider engaging in this work with us if you haven't yet by coming uh, into the work as an assessor going forward. As Heather pointed out, we do have our purposeful sample of programs and candidates. We're slightly over 300 candidates who will engage this spring. Uh, our 19 programs that worked with us in the pilot will come back and be in the field test again, and we were able to add additional programs. So uh, again, a way though to still participate and learn deeply about this work is to come along and apply to be an assessor with us. So we invite you to do that. And with that, uh, I think we'll go ahead and move on and uh, get you ready for the day. We've got some really exciting sessions coming up and very uh, interested in having you stay with us today and engage in these sessions. So I will turn it back to Heather, perhaps, or Gay, I'll to take walk it. us through the day. It's Thank actually you. Julie. So I will turn it Julie, to Julie. Julie, please walk us through the day. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, Mary and Adam and Heather and Amy for just a wonderful way to kick off the morning and a great keynote with all of that literacy data. It is truly, truly amazing. And I'm Massive feat, so congrats. Um, okay, so let's talk about logistics for the day so that you are squared away and feeling good about the sessions that you're going to uh, select for today. Here is your at-a-glance conference schedule. Uh, you will notice there are six columns, each organized by strands, and the rows are the times. So we have our first session starting at 10.10. 10. Each session is 50 minutes except for two sessions today. In column two, you'll notice that 5.2 is a double session, as well as column five, that's another double session. So you can uh, look this over and think about the sessions that you'd like to attend today. And if we go to the next slide, thank you. Here is the link, I will go ahead and put it in the chat. I need to grab it, hold on. Um, maybe Heather, you could grab that and put it in the chat because she's quick like that. Um, so here is the program guide. So if you're wondering, how do I enter that session? This is your lifeline link. And if we go to the next slide, I'll show you how to kind of read that program guide. So this is how you navigate it. I believe that all the session two uh, outlines are start on around page 14 of the program guide. And if you go back, yeah, perfect. Um, it'll give you the title. So you'll know if that's of interest to you, the names of the presenters. There is the Zoom room link there. And below that is the link to the materials for that session. And a sort of a general focus. Is this a focus to you? This is for example, 4.5 is around the Cal APA. And we kind of give a suggested audience link there. Um, and as we go to the next 
slide. If you have any trouble today, you, we have our very own genius bar that we like to call it. Uh, these names and emails are also in the program guide. And I will link that for you now. And I believe Zoltan will talk to us about evaluation. But if you have any questions, please go to the program guide and reach out to anyone that um, any of our troubleshooters for support. Yes, thank you, Julie. Um, and again, thank you to everybody uh, for this morning. Um, and again, congratulations to Gay. Uh, this the organization that you're seeing here is uh, largely largely done uh, uh, due to her. So thank you for that. Um, so at the end of today, uh, there will be at the end of your sessions, there will be a conference evaluation. Uh, we really appreciate you. Um, or a new house. We will ask you sort of your uh, how useful the entire conference was for you, plus specific uh, presentations. Um, we provide your feedback to the presenters, um, and we really do look at it in terms of our planning for next year. So please take a few moments today to complete that as well. And I believe our breakout sessions will begin at 1010. And we will see you uh, in the smaller rooms. Thank you, everybody.